and Bandula conveyed Mallika to Savati. She bore twin sons sixteen times in succession, and they were all mighty men and heroes, and became perfected in all manner of accomplishments. Each one of them had a thousand men to attend him, and when they went with their father to wait on the king, they alone filled the courtyard of the palace to overflowing. One day, some men who had been defeated in, in code on a false charge, seeing Bandula approach, raised a great outcry and informed him that the judges of the court had supported a false charge. So Bandula went into the court and judged the case, and gave each man his own. The crowd uttered loud shout of applause. The king asked what it meant, and on hearing was much pleased. All those officers that he sent away and gave Bandula charge of the judgment court. And thenceforward he judged aright. Then the former judges became poor because they no longer received bribes, and they slandered Bandula in the king's ear, accusing him of aiming at the kingdom himself. The king listened to their words and could not control his suspicions. But he reflected, if he be slain here, I shall be blamed. He suborned certain men to harry the frontier districts. Then sending for Bandula, he said, The borders are in a blaze. Go with your sons and capture the brigands. With him he also sent other men su sufficient, mighty men of war, with instructions to kill him and his two and thirty sons, and cut off their heads and bring them back. While he was yet on the way, he hired the brigands, got wind of the general's coming, and took off flight. He settled the people of that district in their homes and quieted the province, and set out for home. Then, when he was not far from the city, those warriors cut off his head and the heads of his son. On that day, Malika had sent an invitation to the two chief disciples along with five hundred of the brethren. Early in the forenoon, a letter was brought to her with news that her husband and sons had lost their heads. When she heard this, without a word to a soul, she tucked the letter in her dress and waited upon the company of the brethren. Her attendant had given rise to the brethren, when bringing in a bowl of ghee, they happened to break the bowl just in front of the elders. Then the captain of the faith said, Pots are made to be broken, do not trouble about it. The lady produced her letter from the fold of her dress, saying, here I have a letter informing me that my husband and his two and thirty sons have been beheaded. If I do not trouble about that, am I likely to trouble when a bowl is broken? The captain of the fate now began, unseen, unknown, and so forth, then rising from his seat uttered a discourse and went home. She summoned her two and thirty daughters-in-law, and to them said, You husbands, though innocent, have reaped the fruit of their former deeds. Do not grieve, nor commit a sin of the soul, worse even than the king's. This was her advice. The king's spies, hearing this speech, brought word to him that they were not angry. Then the king was distressed and went to her dwelling, and craving pardon of Malika and her son's wives, offers a boon, she replied, be it accepted. She set out the funeral feast, and bathed, and then went before the king, my lord, she said, you granted me a boon, I want nothing but this, that you permit my two and thirty daughters-in-law and me to go back to our own homes. The king consented. Each of her two and thirty sons' wives she sent away to her home, and herself returned to the home of her family in the city of Kushinara. And the king gave the post of commander-in-chief to one Diga Karayana, sister's son to the general Bandula. 
but he went about picking faults in the king and saying, he murdered my uncle. Even after the murder of the innocent Bandula, the king was devoured by remorse and had no peace of mind, felt no joy in being king. At that time, the master dwelt near a country town of the Sakyas named Ulumpa. Thither went the king, pitched a camp not far from the park, and with a few attendants went to the monastery to salute the master, the five symbols of royalty he handed to Karayana, and alone entered the perfumed chamber. All that followed must be described as in the Dhamma Chetya Sutta. When he entered the perfumed chamber, Karayana took those symbols of royalty and made Vidudaba the king, and leaving behind for the king one horse and a serving woman, he went to Savati. After a pleasant conversation with the master, the king on his return saw no army. He inquired of the woman and learned what had been done. Then set out for the city of Rajagaha, resolved to take his nephew with him and capture Bidudaba. It was late when he came to the city. The gates were shut, and lying down in a shed, exhausted by exposure to wind and sun, he died there. When the night began to grow brighter, the woman began to wail, My lord, the king of Kosala is past. Help! The sound was heard, and news came to the king. He performed the obsequies of his uncle with great magnificence. Vidudaba, once firmly established on the throne, remembered that grudge of his and determined to destroy the Sakyas, one and all to which end he set out with a large army. That day, at dawn, the master, looking forth over the world, saw destruction threatening his kin. I must help my kindred, thought he. In the forenoon, he went in search of arms. Then, after returning from his meal, lay down lion-like in his perfume chamber. And in the evening time, having passed threw the air to a spot near Kapilavatu, set beneath a tree that gave scanty shade. Hard by that place, a huge and a shady banyan tree stood on the boundary of Vidudaba's realms. Vidudaba, seeing the master approach and saluting him, said, Why, sir, are sitting under so thin a tree in all this heat? Sit beneath this shady banyan, sir. He replied, Let be, O king, the shade of my kindred keeps me cool. The master, thought the other, must have came, come here to protect his clansmen. So he saluted the master and returned again to Savati, and the master, rising, went to Jetavana. A second time the king called to mine his grudge against the Sakyas. A second time he set forth and again saw the master seated in the same place, then again returned. A fourth time he set out, and the master, scanning the former deeds of the Sakyas, perceived that nothing could do away with the effect of their evil doing in casting poison into the river. So he did not go thither to thither the fourth time. Then King Vidudaba slew all the Sakyas, beginning with babes at the breast, and with their hearts blood washed the band and returned. On the day after the master had gone out for the third time and returned, he, having gone his rounds of for, rounds for arms, and his meal over, was resting in his perfume chamber. The brethren gathered from all directions into the hall of throat, seating themselves, began to tell of the virtues of the great being. Sirs, the master but showed himself and turned the king back, and set free his kinsmen from the fear of death. A helpful friend is the master to his clan. The master entered and asked what they talked of as they sat there. 
they told him that he said, Not now only, brethren, does the Tathagata act for the benefit of his kinsmen. He did the same long ago. With these words, he told a story of the past. Once upon a time, when Brahmadatta ruled as king in Benares and, and observed the ten royal virtues, he thought to himself, All over India, the kings live in a palace supported by many a column. There is no marvel then in a palace supported by many columns. But what if I make a palace with one column only to support it? Then I shall be the chiefest king of all kings. So he summoned his builders and told them to build him a magnificent palace supported on one column. Very good, said they, and away they went into the forest. There they beheld many a tree, straight and great, worthy to be single column of such a palace. Here are these trees, said they, but the road is rough, we can never transport them. We will go ask the king about it. When they did so, the king said, by hook or by crook, you must bring them, and that quickly. But they answered, Neither by hook nor by crook can be, can the thing be done. Then said the king, Search for a tree in my park. The builders went to the park, and there they spied a lordly salt tree, straight and well grown, worshipped by a village and town. And to it the royal family also were wont to pay tribute and worship. And they told the king, said the king, In my park ye have found me a tree. Good, go and cut it down. So be it, said they, and repaired to the park with their hands full of perfumed garlands and the like. Then hanging upon it a five spray garland and encircling it with a string, fastening to it a nosegay of flowers and kindling a lamp, they did worship, explaining, On the seventh day from now we shall cut down this tree. It is the king's command. It is the king's command so to cut it down. Let the deities who dwell in this tree go else whither, and not unto us be the blame. The god who dwelt in the tree bearing, the, bearing this thought to himself, These builders are determined to cut down this tree and to destroy my place of dwelling. Now my life and only lasts as long as this my abiding place. And all the young salt trees that stand around this where dwell the deities my kinsfolk, and they are many, will be destroyed. My own destruction does not touch me so near as the destruction of my children. Therefore, I must protect their lives. Accordingly, at the hour of midnight, adorned in divine splendor, he entered into the magnificent chamber of the king, and filling the whole chamber with a bright radiance, stood weeping beside the king's pillow. At sight of him, the king, overcome by terror, uttered the first stanza. Who are those standing high in air with heavenly verse, virtue sweated? Whence come thy fears? Why flow the tears in which thine eyes are bathed? On hearing, which the king of the gods repeated to his stanzas. Within thy realms, O king, they know me as the lucky tree. For sixty thousand years I stood, and all I have worshipped me. Though many a town and house they made, and many a king's dwelling, yet me they never did molest, to me no harm did bring. 
then even as the did worship pay, so worship thou, O king. Then the king repeated two stanzas. But such another mighty trunk I never yet did see, so fine a kind in girth and height, so thick and a strong a tree. A lovely palace I will build, one column for support. There I will place thee to abide, thy life shall not be short. On hearing this, the king of the gods repeated two stanzas. Since thou art bent to tear my body from me, cut me small, cut me piecemeal, limb from limb, O king, or not at all. Cut first the top, the middle next, then last the root of me. And if thou cut me so, O king, death will not painful be. Then the king repeated two stanzas. First hands and feet, then nose and ear, while yet the victim lives, and last of all the head let fall, a painful death this gives. O oh, lucky tree, O oh, woodland king, what pleasure couldst thou feel? Why, for what reason dost thou wish to be cut up piecemeal? Then the lucky tree answered by repeating two stanzas. The reason and a reason, this full noble, why piecemeal? I would be cut, O oh, mighty king, come listen while I tell. My kith and kin, all prospering around me, well sheltered grow. These I should crush by one huge fall, and great would be their woe. The king, hearing this, was much pleased. This is a worthy god, this, thought he. He does not wish that his kinsfolk should lose their dwelling place because he loses his. He acts for his kinsfolk's good. And he repeated the remaining stanza. O oh, like a tree, O oh, woodland king, thy thoughts must noble be. Thou would befriend thy kindred. So from fear I set thee free. The king's the king of the gods, having discoursed to this king, then departed. And the king, being established according to his admonition, gave gifts and did other good deeds till he went to fill the host of heaven. The master, having ended this discourse, said, Thus it is, brethren, that the Tathagata acts so as to do good to his kid and kin. And then he identified the birth. At that time, Ananda was the king. The followers of the Buddha were the deities which were embodied in the young saplings of the salt tree. And I was myself, like a tree, the king of the gods.